What will we learn in this topic? The gross anatomy and relations of the parotid gland, parotid duct, structures within the parotid gland, the lymphatic drainage and nerve supply of parotid gland, the patty's fasciovenous plane, development of parotid gland, and the clinical importance of the parotid gland. The word parotid refers to around the ear. Parotid gland is the largest salivary gland. It is lobulated and serous and weighs around 15 to 25 grams. The parotid gland is located in the retromandibular fossa behind the ramus of the mandible. It lies over the masseter muscle anteriorly, the sternocleidomastoid muscle posteriorly. Superior to the gland lays the external acoustic meatus and posterior to the gland lies the mastoid process. The accessory parotid lies anterior to the parotid gland and is a part of the forward extension of the gland, which lies above the parotid duct. Parotid capsule. The parotid gland is enclosed in a fibrous capsule, which is made up of investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. The fascia splits between the mastoid process and the angle of mandible, and it encloses the parotid gland. The capsule has a thick superficial lamina attached to the zygomatic arch and a thin, deep lamina attached to the tympanic plate and the styloid process. A portion of the deep lamina thickens to form the stylomandibular ligament. External features of the parotid gland From the lateral aspect, the parotid gland appears like a three-sided pyramid, with the apex pointed downwards and base superiorly. In the cross-sectional views of the parotid gland, it shows three borders, the medial border, anterior border, and the posterior border. The parotid gland also has four distinct surfaces. The superficial surface, the anteromedial surface, the posteromedial surface, and the superior surface or the base of the parotid gland. Relations of the parotid gland. This section deals with the various structures around the gland and within the gland. Apex of the parotid gland. The apex of the gland overlaps the posterior belly of the digastric muscle and part of the carotid triangle. The structures emerging through the apex are the retromandibular veins and the cervical branch of the facial nerve. The superior surface is a small and concave surface and the structures associated with the superior surface are the external acoustic meatus, the temporomandibular joint, superficial temporal artery and the vein, and auricular temporal nerve. Superficial surface, it is the largest of the four surfaces. The structures associated with the superficial surface are the skin, the superficial fascia containing the anterior branches of the greater auricular nerve, the parotid fascia, and the parotid lymph nodes. Anteromedial surface. This surface follows the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible. The structures associated with the anteromedial surfaces are the ramus of the mandible, the masseter muscle, medial pterygoid muscle, lateral surface of the temporomandibular joint, and branches of the facial nerve. This surface adapts to the mastoid process and its muscular attachments. The structures associated with the posterior medial surface are the mastoid process with the sternocleidomastoid and the posterior belly of digastric muscle attached to it, the styloid process, and the external carotid artery which enters the gland at this point. Borders of the parotid gland It has three borders. The anterior border separates the anteromedial surface from the superficial surface. Structures related to the anterior border are the parotid duct, transverse facial artery and vein and the terminal branch of the facial nerve. These are the temporal branch, zygomatic branch, upper and lower buccal branch, marginal mandibular branch and the cervical branch. The posterior border separates the posteromedial surface and the superficial surface. The structures related to the posterior border are the posterior auricular nerve, posterior auricular artery and vein and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Medial border, it separates the anteromedial surface and the posteromedial surface. 
and it is associated with the lateral wall of the pharynx. Parotid duct. It is also called as the Stenson's duct. It is about 5 cm in length. It begins at the anterior border of the parotid gland and runs forwards and downwards. Superiorly, the duct is related to the accessory parotid, upper buccal branch of the facial nerve, and inferiorly to the lower buccal branch of facial nerve. Course of the parotid duct The duct pierces the buccinator muscle and opens onto the vestibule opposite to the crown of the maxillary second molar. Structures within the parotid gland the parotid gland is transversed by the facial nerve, retromandibular vein and the external carotid artery. Facial nerve enters the gland at the posterior medial surface and gives out its branches. These are the temporal branch, zygomatic branch, upper and lower buccal branch, marginal mandibular branch and the cervical branch. These branches radiate to the anterior border of the gland like a goose foot. The retromandibular vein occupies the central portion in the gland and is formed by the union of the superficial temporal vein with the transverse facial vein and maxillary vein. The anterior branch of the retromandibular vein joins the facial vein to form a common facial vein. The posterior division joins the posterior auricular vein to form the external jugular vein. The parotid gland drains into the retromandibular and the external jugular veins. The external carotid artery enters the gland by piercing the lower part of the posterior medial surface. It divides into the superficial temporal artery, posterior auricular artery, transverse facial artery and the maxillary artery. The parotid gland is thus supplied by the external carotid artery and the superficial temporal artery. Lymphatic drainage The lymph from the parotid gland drains into the superficial and the deep parotid lymph nodes and finally into the deep cervical lymph nodes. Nerve supply of parotid gland The parotid gland is supplied by the parasympathetic, sympathetic and the sensory nerve fibers. The parasympathetic nerves reach the gland through the auriculotemporal nerve and these are secretomotor. On stimulation of parasympathetic fibers, the gland produces watery secretions. The preganglionic fibers arise in the medulla, pass through the grossopharyngeal nerve, its tympanic branch, the tympanic plexus and the lesser petrosal nerve and relays into the otic ganglion. The postganglionic fibers arise from the otic ganglion and pass through the auricular temporal nerve which is also the branch of the mandibular nerve to reach the parotid gland. Sympathetic nerve supply. This is derived from the nerve plexus around the external carotid artery. Stimulation of the sympathetic nerve fibers causes release of thick and sticky secretion. Sensory nerve supply. The sensory fibers provide sensation to the parotid fascia that covers the gland and is derived from the auricular temporal nerve and sensory fibers of the greater auricular nerve. Patty's fasciovenous plane. The parotid gland has a large superficial lobe and a small deep lobe. These are connected to each other by a mass of glandular tissue called the isthmus. The plane between the lobes is the area where the facial nerve and the retromandibular vein passes. This plane is significant because surgeons use the knowledge about this plane while removing the superficial lobe of the parotid gland when affected by tumor in order to protect the nerves in the vein. Development of the parotid gland begins in the sixth week of intrauterine life. It is ectodermal in origin and develops from the buccal epithelium lateral to the angle of the mouth. The ectodermal outgrowth begins with the formation of a pre bud, then into an initial bud, late initial bud, and finally into several buds that form the future acini of the gland. The ectodermal outgrowth branches to form the ductal system and the parotid acini. Clinical Importance of Parotid Gland Mumps It is also called as viral parotitis and is an infectious disease of the parotid gland. This condition is caused by the myxovirus. Clinically, it is seen in children under 15 years of age 
there is acute inflammation and swelling of the parotid gland. There is no suppuration seen in mumps. However, it can be associated with pain and fever. Complications include orchitis and pancreatitis. Mixed parotid tumor. This condition is also called as pleomorphic adenoma and accounts for 45 to 75 percent of all the salivary neoplasms. It is a benign neoplasm of the parotid gland and mostly affects the superficial lobe of the gland. It is painless as it does not involve the facial nerve and is slow in growth. Microscopically, it shows a mixed nature with presence of epithelial and myoepithelial cells, hence the term pleomorphic. Although it is a benign neoplasm, it can become malignant where it shows signs like pain, rapid enlargement and involvement of the cervical lymph nodes. Parotid abscess. This condition occurs due to spread of infection to the gland from the oral cavity via the parotid duct. Causes of parotid abscess can be obstruction of the duct, poor oral hygiene and dental infections. Clinically, it can appear as an indurated erythematous swelling. The abscess can spread to the parapharyngeal spaces or can break open onto the cheek. Treatment of parotid abscess involves administration of broad-spectrum antibiotics. Drainage might be required in acute conditions where Hilton's method is applied. This technique involves a horizontal incision at the root of auricle and below the angle of the mandible. This is done to expose the fascia. It is followed by a blunt horizontal incision in parotid capsule parallel to the branches of the facial nerve to drain the abscess. Fray syndrome. This condition is characterized by sweating of face while thinking of food. This condition can be caused due to parotidectomy, that is removal of the parotid gland, or during penetrating wound of the parotid gland. The nerves affected are the auricular temporal and the greater auricular nerve. Clinically, one can see flushing, that is a hot and red face, sweating of the face, and cutaneous hyperesthesia, which is increased sensitivity to stimulation like touch. Let's have a look at the mechanism of Frey syndrome. As explained earlier, under normal conditions, the parotid gland is supplied by the auricular temporal nerve that contains parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers. The parasympathetic fibers are secretomotor and stimulate saliva secretion, while the sympathetic fibers are vasomotor and supply the sweat glands and the blood vessels. In Frey syndrome, the damaged parasympathetic nerve fibers heal abnormally by growing along the sympathetic fiber pathways and connect to the sweat glands and blood vessels on the skin. So now the parasympathetic fibers that normally signals the parotid gland to release saliva now send signal to the sweat glands to produce sweat and blood vessels to cause dilation. Clinical presentation of this syndrome is when a person eats food, the face becomes red, hot and sweats. This is called as gustatory sweating. Also there is increased sensitivity to touch called as cutaneous hyperesthesia. Parotid calculi. Sometimes stones or calculi may form in the parotid gland or the duct that can reduce the salivary secretions. Identification of the calculi is possible through a procedure called cyalogram. It uses a radiographic dye injected through the opening of the duct. The dye can be traced using radiographs and location of the calculi can be assessed. So to summarize, Parotid gland is a larger salivary gland which weighs about 15 to 25 grams. It is a three-sided pyramid with an apex pointing downwards, three borders and four surfaces. Nerve supply to parotid gland is through the parasympathetic fibers via the auricular temporal nerve, sympathetic supply and the sensory supply. Blood supply is through the external carotid artery and the superficial temporal artery. Venous drainage occurs in the retromandibular veins. Lymphatic drainage occurs in the deep cervical lymph nodes. Development of parotid gland occurs during the sixth week of intrauterine life. Clinical importance is that it is involved in mumps, mixed parotid tumor, parotid abscess, and Frey syndrome.
You can find the link to MCQs for the topic in the description of the video. Thank you for watching the video. We hope you liked it. And if you did, please subscribe to the channel for more videos and hit the notification bell for update on new videos. So see you in the next video. Till then, stay healthy and have an amazing week.